the next one and tell them it's time. It's time to hear from the Word of God. Let's put a uh, big round of applause to Pastor Mike as he comes and shares the Word of God with us. Good morning, everybody. Praise the Lord. Good morning to everybody who's following us online today and any of our members that are at home watching. Maybe you're not well today or whatever, or if you're on holiday even, because I know holiday season has started. We have those that are gone on holiday. I want to thank both uh, Sister Mary Mawenwa and Brother Andan. You both came forward today to share prophetic things, pastoral ministry, which fits in so much with what I'm going to share today. And I always love it when that happens. In fact, it happens, I think, virtually every time I preach, that someone comes and shares something to confirm the preach message that I'm about to, <coughs> excuse me, that I'm about to bring. So today, my message is called, for Ross over there, my message is called, The Bubbling Up. The Bubbling Up. And we will start by going to the Gospel of John, John Chapter 5, and I'm going to read some verses from John chapter 5. Okay, starting at verse 2. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving or in the Amplified, the bubbling up of the water. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. Now a certain man was there who had an infirmity 38 years. And when Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been in that condition a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man, no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I am coming, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, Rise, take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed and walked. And that day was the Sabbath. And we can read a little bit later on, Jesus meets that man again. And this is what Jesus said to him. Jesus found him in the temple and said, See, you have been made well, sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. So this shows us a couple of things. Firstly, that sin can lead to physical conditions in our lives. Now, seeing as he'd been 38 years in this condition, this man must have been pretty old because he'd reached an age where he could have sinned before this even happened. This, this crippleness, this paralyzed life that he had. Or possibly, another alternative is that in his condition, in his sense of feeling abandoned and hopeless in life, he'd start to develop in a particular sin within his life. We don't know where the sin came from. But one thing I want to say is that Jesus never said to him, when you repent, I will heal you. Jesus never said to him, first get your life sorted out. But he went and healed this man. Before any act of confession or repentance even occurred, and I'm saying that to show us the Bible teaches that His kindness leads us to repentance. Sometimes the love of God just melts us and makes us repent and turn from things that are wrong. Praise God. But let's look at this passage in a little bit more detail now. So we go to verse uh, 2 first of all. Uh, there is in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate a pool which is in Hebrew is called Bethesda. Now I think many of you might remember, in fact my daughter Misha preached a subject uh, similar from John chapter 5. But Bethesda means the house of mercy. And for those of you who came on the church retreat, you remember I did a study on what the different numbers in the Bible mean. And the number 5 means grace and mercy. These, none of these things in the Bible are ever coincidental. 
There were five porches of grace and mercy from God. If we have a look. I don't know how long this man, or sorry, I don't know how long this place, Bethesda, had been in existence. But all we can know is that supernatural thing happened here. By the grace and mercy of God, from time to time, supernatural things happened and miracles occurred and people got healed. Now we don't read any of this anywhere in the, New, in the Old Testament and we don't see any of this in the historical uh, writings of Israel or Jewish history. The only one that does mention it is Josephus in his history and he mentions that this was there at the time of Jesus. It makes me believe and a lot of commentators think that this Bethesda, the miracles started happening, coinciding with the life of Jesus Christ, showing that the Messiah was actually here. Because if you see the type of diseases that are particularly mentioned, they were the diseases that only Messiah could come and cure. They were the things that only Messiah could do. So I believe Bethesda was a symbolic pointing sign to Jesus Christ Messiah. As Jesus is the merciful one. Now, the Messiah is the only... This, yeah, you can go back to the verse. Blind, lame and paralysed, waiting for the moving of the water. Today, I believe that God wants to move His water in our midst. I believe today we are going to see a bubbling up and a moving and a stirring of the water of God, the Spirit of God, in this service amongst everybody here. The bubbling of the Holy Spirit, the stirring of the Spirit means the move of the Spirit and it means the miracle of God. And today maybe you are here today and you are looking for a miracle in your life. And maybe you've been in your condition for 38 years like this man or maybe longer maybe shorter. It doesn't matter how long it is, but today is the day for the moving of the Spirit in our lives. Amen. Every one of us is here. There is an opportunity for you today for the stirring up of the water, for God to do something supernatural, out of grace and out of mercy. And you know what? He didn't even say, I want you repentant and I want you on your knees and I want you broken before I will even do it. He is willing to show His love and kindness even to unrepentant hearts. Maybe today you've been waiting for a bubbling up and a stirring of the water in your own life and situation. You've been waiting for God to move, waiting for God to do something. Maybe you've even got to the point where you feel like giving up. Maybe you feel like, when is God going to do it for me? Because I've been in this condition for 38 years and there's no one there to help me. There's no one there to change my situation. There's no one there to give me a helping hand. There's no one there to bring me through. And you may not be crippled physically today. But I know that there are people here who may be crippled with mental illness. They may be crippled with depression. May be crippled by a trauma that they've experienced at some point in their lives. Maybe today you are crippled by debt. And that makes you paralyzed to do what you would love to be able to do. Maybe you're crippled in some other way, in some other area, some other situation in your life. Maybe you're crippled in a relationship that you are in. Maybe you're crippled by fear, crippled by worry, crippled by a concern for the future. Some people are crippled emotionally. They are crippled. They feel awkward among people, awkward to know what to say. They feel tongue-tied, crippled emotionally. Others are crippled by guilt. Some are crippled by their past. Some are crippled even by sickness. Some are crippled by failure. Today, there is a deliverer here in this place. And he has come to set captives free. And today the deliverer is stirring up the waters. Stirring up the waters and moving by his spirit to perform the miracle that we are all desirous of. However long you might have waited for it. However many times you thought maybe it's going to happen. Today is your day. Today is the day of stirring up, for the Spirit of God is here uniquely for everyone and every individual amongst us. 
Now, it's a long time that that cripple had been waiting. But it's not too long for a God who is not bound by time. Today, not only is he able to restore and to deliver and set free and give you the miracle, but he talks about restoring the years that the locust has eaten in your life. In other words, making up for the years that have been wasted in the condition of crippleness that you've actually gone through. So I want to say to you today, whatever your situation, do not give up hope. There is always hope because Jesus is alive and he's here right now. Today is your day to receive your Bethesda and the mercy and the grace of God in your situation. If we move to verse 4, it says this. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. Whoever stepped in first after the stirring up of the water, was made well of whatever disease he had. So I want you to imagine the scene. It's a whole load of sick people waiting, waiting patiently, earnestly, close to this water. For the moment that the water starts to move and then there's a big rush to be first one there, to get the miracle. To get the healing. Maybe it's a bit like the January sales in London or in Boxing Day when everyone is waiting outside the door, rushing in to be the first one to get that prized thing inside. Maybe it's like getting onto a tube on a crowded platform where everyone fights and pushes each other out of the way. But you can imagine the scenario here is that it's every man for himself. There's no mention or no uh, possibility that any of those people were going to say, well look, I've only got a headache, I can see that you are blind, I can see that you can't walk. There was nobody that said, you go before me and you go first, your need is greater than mine. But as typical to all humanity, we think so selfishly only about me, my life, my situation and me getting there first. To get what I need, even if it's at the expense of someone else. It's like a stampede and every man is for himself. And obviously, the blind would never see that the waters are being stirred up. They're not going to get there quickly. And the lame and the crippled will never get there quickly because they can't move fast enough. The blind, the lame and the crippled would always be the ones that get left behind. Today, God is not going to leave you behind. Today, whatever your situation, however slow you might have been, however reluctant you might have been, the grace and the mercy override all of that today. For today is Bethesda and the bubbling up of the water in this place. And I thought to myself, why isn't it that anybody who just got healed why don't they come out of the water and say, next time I'm with you, brother, I'm going to help you into the water. But again, there's no mention that, that anybody did anything like that. It was, I've got my healing and now I'm off. I don't care about anyone else or anything else. And how many people treat God exactly the same way? I've got my miracle. I've got what I need. I don't care about anyone else. You know, when you've heard the gospel and Jesus has saved your soul, we have a duty to go back and help others in the same condition that we came out of. When we've received from God, we've received also to be a blessing and give to somebody else and not pass them by. But the fact is, it said in the first verse we read that multitudes of sick people were at these porches waiting by the poolside. And the multitudes of sick people figuratively represent the whole of the human race. Every single human being is in need of Bethesda. Every human being is in need of the grace and the mercy of God for salvation, for healing, for miracle, for life, for eternal life, for whatever it is that we require. We all need our own Bethesda today. We are all spiritually blind until we meet Jesus Christ and that's why we sing the song, I once was blind but now I see. 
It was amazing grace and mercy that saved a wretch like me. And now, I'm blind, and now I once was blind in my eyes and now open I can show the way to somebody else. Well, we are supposed to. But also figuratively, this is telling us that every human being is actually disabled. We are disabled and paralysed and crippled in our souls, even if not in our bodies. Our souls are disabled, our spirits are disabled and they need healing. And only the miracle of God can do that. So we reach verse 6. And as we get to verse 6 we read this. When Jesus saw him lying there. When Jesus saw him. There was something that when Jesus saw him. Stirred up Jesus to go to this man, which was the Spirit of God leading him to go to this man. There were a lot of people there. Jesus did not go to all of them, but he went to this man. He went to this man and he was stirred up to go to this man because he saw him and had pity and compassion and mercy on the condition that he was in. Do you know that as Jesus looks at every one of us today, his eyes fill with tears as he sees the condition that every one of us are in in this world. As he looks at us in our lives and he thinks what we could be, what he's prepared for us, what he's provided for us and so much that we miss. He sees us laying there empty. Sees us laying there consumed with all sorts of things in life and missing the most important of all. Or as we've heard from prophetic things today, we want his hands but we don't really want him. We want the miracle, but we don't really want him. And Jesus saw him. And today he's looking at you and he can see you. Even if you're down the back of the church and I can't see you, he can see you. Not only can he see you, he looks beyond the physical body that I can see. He's looking into your heart right now. And as he looks into the heart of every single one of us, he sees the need and he's filled with compassion and love to reach out to every one of us with his Bethesda. And Jesus saw him and he's seen you in your condition today. And those, though sometimes you think no one else knows and no one else cares, certainly that's how this man felt. Who cares about me? They've got their miracles and now they've gone off home. But I'm stuck here day in, day out, even at his bed there, we read, because he took up his bed and walked. He slept there. That was his home. He lived there. Yeah, he knew nothing else in his life. Jesus looks at you. He can't pass you by today because you're too precious. And he's looking at you and he knows that you've been in your situation and condition a long time as well. Trapped, bound, crippled, unable to break free. And he said, do you want to be made well? When Jesus saw him there, he's also seeing you today. In his physical body, when he walked the earth, Jesus could only be in one place at one time. He couldn't be in two locations. But now in his glorified condition, God is everywhere. Jesus is in Japan right now, he's in China, he's in London. And Jesus is able to come to every single one of us simultaneously now. Because he he's does it in the spirit. And so when it says that Jesus saw the man lying there today, I want to say to you that you are the one that he's coming to today. Just because he went to one person here at Bethesda, today you are the one. I am the one that he's coming to today. So don't think that this is for someone else or that today you also are going to be left behind like this invalid was. Today you are the one that he's actually coming to in a special and in a unique way. And when Jesus looks at us, the waters of the Spirit of God bubble up inside of him. The waters of healing. The waters of the miraculous. 
the waters of whatever it is I need in my life to help me in my situation. And as we reach verse 7, this is what the invalid said. He said, Sir, I have no man. I have no man to help me. No one to lead me. No one to guide me. I have no man. You would have thought, like I said, that somebody who had been healed might have been there to give a helping hand, but there was no one. But Jesus said, I will lead you by the hand, and I will never let go of your hand, and I will lead you by the hand, because I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. In fact, Jesus says, I don't need to take you to the water, I am the waters. I am the Bethesda that you are looking for. I can take you there because I am the way, the truth, and I am the bubbling life that you are searching for. Sir, I have no man to help me. And maybe today you feel helpless and all alone, but you're not. Because there's somebody who's looking out for you right now and has watched you ever since the day you were born, growing up from your first day at school and the day you entered this world, In the hospital, where you were born, he's been there, my God, from the very beginning. So I want to look at these waters a little bit. What are these waters that need to bubble up? Where do they come from? What are they? Revelation 22, verse 1 tells us. He showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and the Lamb. The Lamb is Jesus. From the throne of God, there is an unending, because God has no beginning and no end, there's an unending supply of the Spirit of God. It never ends. It continues to flow for all of eternity. This scene is is actually pictured in heaven if you go into verse 2 as well. But from, from the throne of God come streams of living water continually. Out of the heart of God. Out of the temple. Out of the innermost part of God come streams of living water. And it's a pure river of water. And today that river wants to flow not just among us. But he wants to flow from within us. And for everybody who's born again, you can have that opportunity today to have the river flowing from within. If you're not born again, you can still enjoy the river from without because Bethesda is here. But ideally, that river should be within each and every one of us. So where do we find these waters today? In the previous chapter of from where we read in our reading, we go to John chapter 4, you will read this in verses 10 to 14. It's a well-known story. We call it the Samaritan woman or the woman at the well. And it's no coincidence that the woman was at the well, searching for her water. But the well, water that comes from the well has impurities in it, and the deeper you go, the more mud and bits of stone and things you're going to get from the well, and one day that well will dry up. But there's a different well that Jesus wanted to talk to her about. And it's the well that comes from the throne and from the heart of God. And Jesus said to her, If you knew the gift of God, today I want to say to you, the gift of God is here for you. Do you know the gift of God? The gift of God is a person, for God so loved the world that he gave. His only begotten Son. The gift of God is Jesus. He's the ultimate, greatest gift of all. That's why we celebrate Christmas. Christ is the gift of God, but also the Holy Spirit is the gift of God. As are the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Salvation is a gift of God. Eternal life is a gift from God. And today, Bethesda, mercy and grace are the free gift of God. None of these gifts you have to pay for. They're all freely bestowed out of love from a Father that cares for us more than we can ever know. Today, 
Do you know the gift of God? Do you want to know the gift of God? The person, the gift, and also what other gifts he may have for us. If we continue to read. If you knew the gift of God and who it is who and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you the living water. Living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with. How and the well is deep. When where then do you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself as well as his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered and said to her, whoever drinks of this water from the well is going to thirst, thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. Today I want to ask you, are you born again? Have you received the water's which cause you to never thirst again. But the water that I shall give him will, be, will become in him a fountain of water springing up, bubbling up into everlasting life. God wants to give us that water, that Holy Spirit inside of each of us. And many of you here are born again already, but you've never developed it further. You do not know the bubbling up of the water, even though you would say, you have Holy Spirit in your life. Christ's desire. I hope that we will get this today. Turn to your neighbour and say, stay awake, please. He's speaking to you. If I hear any more snoring, okay, I'm going to come and whop you on the head with my microphone. I know it's hot in here. Praise God. Okay. Now I forget what I was going to say. <laughs> What was I going to say? Praise the Lord. Yeah, God's desire is that every single one of us will become a Bethesda Amen. to this world. He wants the bubbling up of the water inside of our lives when we're born again and filled with the Spirit of God. He wants that bubbling up to come out of us and to go to all of this world. You and I are called to be Bethesdas today. Just as Jesus is the ultimate Bethesda, we are called to be Bethesdas that the world will come to, searching for meaning and purpose and direction in life. We are called to be filled with this bubbling up and that we will be houses, temples of mercy and grace for our Lord Jesus Christ. John 7, it says this on a very similar theme. On the last day of the feast, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood up and he cried out in a loud voice and he said, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Now we're not talking about drinking Lucas Aid or water or a cup of tea in the morning. We're talking drinking the streams of living water that come from the Spirit of God that will satisfy you and will cause you to never thirst again because you found what you're looking for and you're overflowing with life. That's his aim, that we might have life and that we might have it abundantly. We should be overflowing with the Holy Spirit. If I asked you here, put your hand up if you're, if you're spirit-filled and you speak in tongues. You've been filled with the Spirit, you speak in tongues. Put your hand up. Praise the Lord. That's most of the people here. So we would regard ourselves as spirit-filled. That's kind of the type of church that we are when people say, what type of church are you, a spiritual church? Yes, we are a spirit-filled church. Let me see if you still believe you're spirit-filled. I'm going to show you a few quick verses. Daniel 3, verse 19. We're just going to read these verses quickly. Nebuchadnezzar was full of fury. And the expression on his face changed towards Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. Because Nebuchadnezzar was full of fury, you could see the anger on his face. And because of the anger and the rage within him, it brought a reaction and an overflow from his life to throw these three into the fiery furnace to kill them. 
for refusing to do what he told them to do, to bow down to the idol. Then we see in Mark 4, verse 41, they were feared and they feared exceedingly. They were full of fear. When people are full of fear, you see it in their lifestyle, you see it in their action. We see in Luke 6, verse 11, the Pharisees were filled with rage because Jesus was doing miracles, he healed people on the Sabbath, and people were turning away from all of these fake religious leaders and were now following the true leader, Jesus Christ. So they were filled with rage, and it had an overflow and an outworking, because they were filled with something. And that rage was that they then went on to have Jesus arrested and crucified later on. In Acts 13, we read this, but when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy, jealousy, envy, and contradicting and blaspheming, they opposed the things spoken by Paul. When you are filled with something, when you're filled with joy, how do we know someone is filled with joy? The Bible talks about people being filled with all sorts of things, but being filled with laughter. How do you know people are filled with joy or filled with laughter or filled with anger? Because there's an overflow. That's the way we know. There's an overflow, a bubbling over. It can't be contained. It can't be restrained any longer. It comes out of us. Who we are from inside comes out of us. What we fill our lives with will come out of us, out of our mouths, with our words, and the deeds and the actions that we do. Other verses speak about people being filled with things. But if I claim to be spirit-filled, as many hands went up here today, if I claim to be spirit-filled, then I must be bubbling over with the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Or I'm not spirit-filled. I might have been spirit-filled at one point, but I'm not spirit-filled if it's something that's past experience. I'm not spirit-filled if it's not a regular, continual bubbling over every day in my life. Spirit-filled means I'm flowing over with the Holy Ghost. With his power, with his love, with his mercy, with his wise words, with, with his kindness, with his joy. It will be seen in us that I'm spirit filled. We won't need to go around telling people, it will be very clear. You don't need to tell, when someone's angry, you don't need them to tell you, I'm angry. You see that they're angry. You run away from them and hide. Praise the Lord. <laughs> I'm not looking anywhere. <laughs> When people are filled with jealousy or anger or anything or rage, it consumes them. It takes them over. And if we're filled with Holy Spirit, it will consume us and take us over. Be leading us. And that's what God is looking for. A whole church of Bethesda's. Wouldn't that be awesome? Be so powerful. <coughs> Only took 12 to revolutionize the whole world the known world at that time. But many of us here, despite our claims to be spirit-filled, are not overflowing with Holy Spirit. So if we look at John 5 verse 4 again, that verse says, An angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. Today, there needs to be a stirring up. If I'm not bubbling over with the Spirit of God, there needs to be a stirring up inside of me. And I thank our sister Mary today when she came forward. I spoke, I said to Harun and Pastor Vicky, she is sharing what I'm going to share today. And, and Dan as well. A bubbling up comes by a stirring up. And today, God is saying he wants to stir up so many of us in this place. A new, fresh stirring up within our lives. Stirring up the waters that are there. In fact, we might call it another way fan into flame the embers that have been dying Amen. what's inside of us that's been dying out God wants to fan that flame again and make it burn brightly to bubble over the Holy Ghost from within so how am I going to stir that up it says 2 Timothy 1 verse 6 Paul said to Timothy I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands Stir that up. 
Because it's there, but it's dormant. And many of us here today have something dormant inside of us that God says, I want to stir it up again. You've got to stir up the Holy Spirit where you used to be full of tongues, speaking in tongues. You gave prophecies. You saw visions regularly. You were moving in the Spirit of God. And do you know what? That's why when we're on mission, we see so many things. Because we only have time for those things. Often when we're back here in London, we get bogged down with so many things that really I don't think are pastoral at all, but we end up doing them. But when we're on mission, wow, we can just be focused on being filled with the Spirit everywhere we go. Hallelujah. And it's exciting. Stir up what is in there or what hasn't been used for years. Maybe you've prophesied before in the past, but it's not been done for months or years. It needs to be stirred up again. Maybe you used to see visions. They need to be stirred up again. Maybe you used to give messages in tongues. It needs to be stirred up again. Maybe you used to go evangelizing and your gift was evangelism, but now it's gone dead. It needs to be stirred up again. Amen. There is a gift inside every one of us that God put there when He created us. And if it's not manifesting, it needs to be stirred up. And today, God wants to stir up, stir up in each of our lives. The angel, the Spirit of God Himself is here to stir up within us. Paul told Timothy, stir up this power that I put within you. You got filled with the Holy Spirit, you spoke in tongues, and then what happened? It's gone, disappeared, died away. Wasted, But it's there somewhere inside of my heart waiting to be reignited, rekindled and reflamed. And the longer, the longer that I've been dormant, the more stirring up is needed to get this light lit up again and going again and, and flowing again. What are the ways that God uses to stir us up? He uses preaching like this to make us want to be stirred up again and inspired again to go for it and say, yes, Lord. I'm not where I should be. I need that again in my life. Challenging us. Sometimes it might be a testimony. You know, one of the things I love to do sometimes is sit down with people and hear their testimony and they tell what God has done for them and how God used them here and they pray for that sick one. And when you hear these things, it stirs you up and say, yeah, I want to do that again. I want that in my life. And it's called iron sharpening iron. When we're with good Christian people, they will be talking about the things of God and it will stir you up. But if the friends and the people you're with, the conversations are never Christ-centered, but are always centered around other things, then you will not be stirred up in your spirit for the right things, but you'll be stirred up for the wrong things. So testimonies inspire us and make us feel like, I want to go and do that again. Then there's this one in Jude, verse 20. It says, Beloved, build yourselves up. Stir it up in your most holy faith by praying in the Holy Ghost. We did that today for a couple of minutes. We're going to do it at the end of my message again. We start each service by saying, let's pray in the Holy Ghost, everybody. Because we're stirring ourselves up ready to praise and worship the Lord. That's why we pray before the service that you might get stirred up. That's why don't come in halfway through because you won't get stirred up. By the end of the service, you're just getting stirred and then you go home and the only thing you stir is sugar in your coffee downstairs. <laughs> when God wants to stir up the spirit in us, praise the Lord. Every Wednesday morning, you can join. There's an hour praying in tongues. If you want to get stirred up on a Wednesday morning, speak to Sister Mary Mwemwa. She leaves that. Every Wednesday morning, an hour, early morning, praying in tongues. Praise God. Getting stirred up. He who speaks in an unknown tongue, the Bible says he edifies himself, he builds himself up, he stirs up what's within him and it begins to come out of him. Yeah. Speaking in tongues is the best thing you can do to stir up the spirit from within you. Another thing we can do is writ written in Ephesians 5, verses 17 to 20, and there it says, Therefore don't be unwise, but understand what the will of God is. The will of God is for you to be Bethesda's. The will of God is not for us to just go through life Attending church, but to be something meaningful in this world as a Bethesda in this world. So don't be unwise. It's gone. But understand what the will of the Lord is. And then he goes on to say how. So don't get drunk with wine, which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. How do I get filled with the Spirit, Paul? He then tells us. Speak to one another in Psalms. We sing them every Sunday. You see the words on the screen. Most of these are psalms. These are scriptures we are singing. Psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. What's a spiritual song? Singing in the Spirit. As you sing in the Spirit, you're singing 
spiritual songs. Singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. As you make melody in your heart, what is happening? Something is being stirred. Something is growing. And then it says in verse 20, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father. A thankful heart is a stirred up heart that will see the move of God. We live in a society where people just spend their whole time moaning and complaining about anything and everything. Always ungrateful. I tell you, when people come with me on mission to some of the places we go in Africa, they don't come back and start moaning anymore about what they have here. They start saying, God, I am so sorry. Forgive me. We don't realise how much we have. It's amazing. The people that have so much always want more. They can never be satisfied. It's insatiable. But there is a thirst that only one can satisfy. And that thirst wants to be satisfied today. It's by the Spirit of God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Time to stir up the gift that is in me. What is your gift? I'm not only now talking about spiritual gifts, I'm talking about natural gifts. Maybe you've got a gift of singing and it's just lay dormant. Maybe a gift of deliverance and praying for people who are bound and demonized and it's going nowhere because you're not stirring it up and you're not using it. Where else do we get stirred up? You come on one of our prayer retreats, you'll be mega stirred up. I tell you, we come back more than stirred, bubbling over. We need to do these things from time to time. Prayer retreats, worship evenings, another chance to get stirred up. Where else can we get stirred up? Encounter weekends, we get stirred up. All of these are opportunities because God puts it upon church leaders to make sure that within our program are plenty of opportunities to get stirred up because for some reason we all slip backwards and downwards and it dries up. It has to be reignited today. I don't know how deep it is inside, but the longer it's been dormant, the more we're going to have to spend stirring it up today. The streams of living water are here. Baptism in the Holy Spirit is here. I'm going to finish with a couple of verses quickly because I want to devote some time for praying for people today. Ephesians 3 verse 20 says this. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that what? Works in us. It's not the power that is in us, but the power that works in us. So you might have the power and it's not working. We have to stir it up so that it works. If your phone runs out of charge, it needs to be recharged so that it can be used again. The phone is there, but it needs to be ignited. And He has given us the Holy Spirit when we were baptised on the encounter weekend or whenever it was in our lives. But today, that Spirit wants to work in us and through us. Because He wants all of us to be a Bethesda in this world. And I'm going to finish with the with verse that we actually got during the pastoral. Which is from Psalm 46 verse 4. We looked at this already today. There is a river whose stream shall make glad the city of God. The holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. There is a river. There is a river that wants to run in us and through us. Streams of living water. So I'm going to ask us all to stand because I want to give opportunity to pray. And I'm going to ask for prayer for a few different things. First opportunity to pray is I want to ask those of you who are looking for the man, looking for the man to lead you to Bethesda today, to the streams. I'm, I'm asking you if you are not born again, you believe in this God, but I'm asking if you're born again. Have you received him into your heart? That's the first prayer. I'm going to hand over in a moment or two to Pastor Vicky. But the first type of person I'm calling is for anybody here 
that doesn't know Jesus in their hearts. The second type of person I want to call is if you've never been filled with the Holy Spirit. You can't be filled with the Spirit until you are born again, first of all. But if you are born again and you've never been filled with the Spirit, you don't speak in tongues, but today you say, I want that in my life. I want to be filled with this. This Holy Spirit, I need Him. And also, I'm going to ask you to come forward. Just need to make different groups so that we know which group we're praying for. And then thirdly, I want to ask those of you who say today, I need to be re-stirred up again. Inside of me there is something that has died. Inside of me there's something that's faded away. Inside of me there's a fire that's going out. Inside of me my battery charge is virtually just on 1%. Inside of me the waters have dried. It needs to be reignited and stirred up today. So I don't know which of them three categories you might find yourself in. Hopefully, you're in category that you're already a Bethesda. But if you're in one of the other categories and you don't want to be in that category anymore, then today is an opportunity for you to be filled with the Spirit, find Jesus as your Saviour, or indeed, have that gift stirred up again that was put in you at one point in your life. Worship team plays this through. I'm going to hand over to Pastor Vicky, but you can start to come if you want prayer, but Pastor Vicky will re-emphasize this as he comes forward.